So, ladies, gentlemen, dear friends, also uh, those watching on Zoom, I want to wish you all a very good afternoon. Uh, November in Berlin can be terrible, but I think we, we've selected a good day for, for this uh, event. My name is Per Törreson. I'm the Swedish ambassador to Germany. I've uh, been posted there since March of 2017. Um, and it's a great pleasure, really, to welcome you to this uh, German-Swedish dialogue, as we call it, on computer games in school. Uh, this is also in conjunction with a uh, fair uh, that we have, uh, uh, an exhibition, uh, which you will see upstairs uh, in, after this uh, event, uh, designed by uh, the Swedish National Center for Architecture and Design, Arktis. And the name of the exhibition, if you're familiar with uh, computer games, you will, you will immediately understand. Jarni Medusa and an Elephant, the craft of Swedish game design. It didn't say much to me, but I, I'm sure my, my daughters uh, know much more. Uh, we will have this exhibition in uh, the uh, Felicius, which is the common Nordic house, until the 19th of December. So. To our watchers on Zoom, uh, don't miss this opportunity to come come by and have a look at it. It's really, it's really good. Uh, and for those of you who are here, you can of course have a look after the event uh, and also enjoy maybe a glass of bubbly uh, stuff and and something to eat. And by the way, we do have two G. So if you if you don't feel like wearing a mask, you don't have to wear it while seated. But if you want to, it's of course fine. Uh, normally, uh, when we talk about Swedes, uh, we say that we are very humble. Uh, but when it comes to computer games, it's really difficult to be humble. Uh, it's been such a success story. Uh, I would say that we, maybe not the dominant power, but we are one of the big uh, countries when it comes to computer games. Uh, and I just, when we prepared uh, this uh, exhibition, realized that the export income that we have from computer game is larger than the, the whole export of Swedish iron ore, which is one of our major products. Uh, it's, it's really stunning. Uh, and some of the biggest uh, German players are also known, uh, owned by Swedish companies. Um, and a big part of the success of the Swedish gaming industry is, of course, the computer game Minecraft. And I believe we will talk about this uh, further today, uh, about the uh, importance actually of Minecraft when it comes to uh, Swedish schools um, based on creativity, imagination and strategic thinking. And isn't it wonderful that kids can really have fun while <laughs> learning uh, mathematics, uh, uh, languages, geography, or you name it. It was very different when I went to school, I can, I can tell you. Uh, and this is also the second Swedish-German dialogue uh, that we have arranged on online uh, learning in schools. Uh, uh, half a year ago or so, we had uh, an event about using uh, uh, digital tools for education where I think uh, the conclusion was that in Sweden we are slightly ahead of our German friends, uh, which also has to do with the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure in this country. Uh, so it's my pleasure also to welcome uh, our panelists today. Uh, we have Tobias Hübner from Coding Schule in Düsseldorf, very welcome. Uh, we have Felix Jullenstig Serau from Gothenburg, also a teacher developing pedagogical games. And we have Professor Linda Breitlauch from the Trier uh, University of Applied Sciences, who will lead us through the discussion. Uh, and after the event, don't hesitate uh, to reach out to us from the embassy. Maybe we can reach, uh, <laughs> stretch our hands so we know who we are. Uh, Nina, Corin, Elizabeth. Uh, if if you are interested in in learning more, or if you want contacts with the Swedish gaming industry, we can we can help uh, provide that. So.
So I, uh, with these short words, I wish us all uh, an interesting, uh, exciting afternoon, uh, also uh, to our followers on Zoom. Uh, I do have to apologize, I will have to leave in about half an hour, uh, but uh, I might be able to come back to join you for the drinks afterwards. Uh, with these few words, uh, thank you very much, and I now hand over to Professor Breitlau to lead us through the discussions, right? Or we have a film. We start with the keynotes. Thank okay. You very, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm, sh I'm not sure who starts. Uh, you start. Okay, so Tobias, please. Thank you very much. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm, um, yeah, I was, um, yeah, very. Um, uh, uh, interested to, to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is video games in schools, which may surprise you. But um, I would like to show you why I am interested in this uh, topic. So I grew up um, playing video games, which looked like this as a space quest. Uh, I played this as a kid with my brother to learn English. And uh, I spent way too much time playing Quake when I grew up, which was one of the first uh, first person shooters. And then I uh, studied uh, German philology and uh, Catholic theology. <laughs> and I quit playing games altogether. So I just uh, studied Greek and Latin and read a lot of books and didn't have any time playing video games. Um, but then I um, saw um, something like this, and maybe you've seen it also. So um, there were a lot of plastic controllers with which you can play music with a video game. And um, that was very interesting, uh, interesting to me, so I was, and I thought, well, um, so, so how does it work? And um, is, are these games teaching how to play a musical instrument? And um, then I watched online and I saw somebody play this game, and let me show you how it looks like. So this is a, a video game controller, and um, he learned playing the drums by playing the video game. And the developer of the game, he actually said, so if you play the drum parts on hard mode, <laughs> so which is the highest difficulty setting, you can pretty much play the drums. And I said, whoa, so that's, that's interesting. So you can play a video game and afterwards you can play the drums or a musical instrument. And uh, I did some more research and um, uh, I came across a person called uh, Toshio Iwai. And uh, he's, a, he's a media artist and he wrote, so previously, uh, playing and composing music was only for people who had been specially educated or trained. But everybody yearns to play or compose music comfortably. So I, myself, am one of them, and I thought this could be realized thanks to new technology like computers. And by these means, I believe people can easily feel more close to music and more satisfied um, than times when they just listen to music that somebody else has composed. So that was his mission, to, to uh, get everybody to uh, learn an instrument or to compose music. And how did he do it? So this is one of his very early games, which is called Otoki for the Nintendo Entertainment System. And there is some music playing in the background. And every time you shoot this ball, there is a sound playing according to the music. So that it always feels like a melody you're playing. So you are, you are playing the game and you are also composing music at the same time. And um, he also did some other work. So this is for the um, Nintendo DS, which is like a handheld system, like a smartphone. And there you can spin the circle and it is playing music or you can um, arrange these leaves on the left side and every time the fish is jumping on the leaf it's playing a note and then you can compose music. And then uh, Yamaha approached Toshio Iwai and they said, well, um, could you imagine um, designing a new digital instrument with us? And he said, yeah, sure. <laughs> and so the Tenorion was born. And this is um, yeah, a musical instrument. Uh, so each of these dots, you, you can press each of these buttons and they light up and um, you can play music like in a sequencer. So uh, if, if you know that and you can make different settings. You can choose the instrument or um, a loop point. 
and um, the volume and so on. And it also has um, a display on the back side. So when you, when you are playing the music, you can use it when you're on stage. So the person uh, sitting in the audience can see. Uh, so let me show you how it looks like. So it was a, a real new instrument that was uh, used on stage, and um, I thought, well, that's that's very interesting. So there's a video game designer um, making a musical instrument and teaching um, kids how to how to play instruments or how to learn music with video games. And then I I, uh, I did some more research. <laughs> so I said, oh, well, that's that's very interesting. So you have to look a bit closer. And I bought this book, which is called The Art of Game Design. And it teaches you how to, how to make a game. And I read this as a teacher. And while reading this, I thought, well, there's a lot of lessons to be learned for teachers by game designers. So for example, um, in video games, you learn by making mistakes. Okay? So this is me playing the world's hardest game. <laughs> you could type it in Google and then you can play the game. So you are this black, uh, uh, sorry, the, the red um, um, uh, figure, the, the um, square, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and um, you, don't, you cannot touch the, the, the everything that's moving around and the game even discourages you. Yeah? Like, don't even bother trying, you won't make it. But... Um, when you play the game, you, you are dying over and over again, but you, 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 you keep on playing the game. So, oh, no, 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 I, I will, I, I can do it, <laughs> let, let me try. And you make a mistake by mistake by mistake. But um, so in school, so everybody is afraid of making mistakes. Well, so this is the worst thing you can do at school, say something wrong. The teacher said, no, that's, that's a mistake. But video games, um, so there when you make mistakes, it's, it, it doesn't, so you, you know you have to make a mistake in order to, to progress in the game. Um, another thing I learned from games is, is you get um, something called instant gratification. Okay, so again, I recorded me playing a video game. So this is called Half-Life and there was a really hard battle you had to fight through. And uh, after the battle, so everybody is saying, oh, wow, you did well, and uh, thank you very much, and you did it, and you feel, as a player, you feel very, you get this, um, yeah, this gratification, and you say, oh, wow, well, I, I really did achieve something. Somebody said you did, you did very well. And um, the third thing I, I learned from video game developers as a teacher is that um, video games try to keep you in something they call the game mechanic zen, all right? So this is um, when a game is not too boring and not too frustrating, then you are in this thing called a game mechanic zen, right? So, so, you, you, uh, so the hours fly by and you just play the game and it's, it's just, it just makes fun and it's, uh, it's not too easy, it's not too frustrating, but it's just right and you can play on and on and on. And um, so this is also something schools struggle with. Um, so to make uh, tasks that are just right for everybody, right? not too easy, not too frustrating. And um, so I even learned that there is a school um, designed, uh, or, or the whole um, school is um, de designed by um, uh, video, oh, no, um, <laughs> the, um, so the, the, um, the school is based on video games, which sounds a bit um, confusing. I say, well, how, how can this be? And the, the school is called Quest to Learn, and it's, it's in New York. And here's uh, the headmaster trying to explain what that means, that the school is based on video games. And maybe we can turn up the volume a little bit. I don't know if, if it will be too... too uh... When we, we talk about we have a school that's based on games, Thanks. the first image that people have in their mind is that we are putting game consoles in the classroom and that kids are sitting 
playing Xbox all day. Um, so there's a, there's a misunderstanding that one, you can stuff content into a game and then stuff a game into a classroom and that's where good learning happens. So it's not an idea of, of putting games in a classroom, but it's rather looking at the design of a learning environment that, that looks and acts very much like a game acts. Okay, so she's talking about a learning environment that looks and acts like a game. And um, I think this is very, very hard to achieve, but a very interesting idea. Maybe we can talk about this later, so how we can achieve this uh, learning environment. And so let, let me show you what, what I do in, in, in my school with video games. So we use a little computer, which is called a Raspberry Pi. So uh, this is from England. It's, it's a very cheap computer. So it costs about 35 euros. Uh, um, and there are even cheaper um, models available. And um, we are, are building our own game controllers. Right? So this is uh, Lego and some, some buttons and uh, the kids are putting this together and they are connecting it to this little computer and then they um, make their own video game controllers. Right? So here you can see the computer and you can just um, take the cables and connect them to the computer and then you can make your own um, video game um, controller. Um, so uh, this is one example. It's, it's, this is a Kinder Surprise egg, <laughs> you know, and uh, we we um, we put a button inside and an LED, and then we can use it to control a game. And the, the, the kids love it because they can learn some electronic, and they can uh, put together this uh, this little thing, and then they can connect it to the computer and play a game with it. Or this is another example. This is um, a, a Tetris. Um, handheld made out of Lego um, with a Raspberry Pi and um, uh, a display inside. So you can be really creative and games are a great way to, to get creative. Um, so um, uh, there's uh, another example. This is an, um, an old wine box. So there was a wine bottle inside and we uh, uh, took some controllers and put them inside and we um, connected the cable to the computer and then you have your own little arcade which you can play with. And we also program games, so on a very basic level, but uh, so kids can understand how a game works in theory. And uh, we are using a language called Scratch and this is, um, yeah, it looks like, like little le digital Lego blocks which you can uh, put together and then you can write a program with it without typing anything. So you, you can type some words or something, but you don't have to. You can um, control it almost entirely by mouse. Okay, you just drag and drop, or if you have a touch screen, you don't even need a mouse, you just drag the blocks, and then you can um, make a little game. And you can do this with um, very small children. So um, the, uh, the group who made this is called Lifelong Kindergarten at the MIT. <laughs> Uh, they made this programming language and this uh, shows their approach. So this is for very young kids and they can, they can learn how a computer works. Um, yeah, so this is a little game we made. It's like, like just a quiz. So there's this cat and it asks questions and you have to type in the answer and so on. And yeah, we also use Minecraft in school. So there is a version f f for Minecraft for this little computer. So the, um, the developer of Minecraft said, oh, this is a great idea, this little computer. Um, so um, he developed a special version of Minecraft for this little computer. And um, the special thing about this version is that it can be programmed. So this is a little program running on the Raspberry Pi and it shows a clock, right? And it, you can see the, the time in Minecraft. And there's um, um, a program running with a programming language called Python, which is quite easy to learn. <laughs> it's a bit more complicated than Scratch, but um, it so kids can learn it. And um, then they can set blocks in Minecraft, and then they can learn about uh, mathematics and um, also um, uh, three-dimensional spaces. So in Minecraft, every block has a coordinate with the X, Y, and Z axis. And um, then, uh, so for example, we give them the task program a house in Minecraft. 
and it's very easy to, to put a block in Minecraft, a solid block. Um, but then we say, okay, but now uh, make it hollow. So make, make a smaller block inside this block out of air. <laughs> and then have to say, okay, so we have this coordinate, so it's x, y, that, z is zero, zero, one, and now I have to extract, and they use graph paper and make a little note and try to, try to do this. And this is, um, yeah, using Minecraft is very engaging for the pupils, so they, they love it very much, and uh, this is a great task for them. So, and we also have um, like a kind of a retro area <laughs> in our school. So this is my old Apple II computer, but maybe you are familiar with, with that. And um, so um, we also try to, yeah, to tell kids where the technology comes from. And it's very interesting when you, so as I said, so I studied uh, philology and theology, so nothing with computer. And um, it was a very interesting journey for me to see that these computers uh, work almost uh, the same like modern computers. Uh, of course, modern computers are a lot faster, but you, you can learn the concept even with this computer. So you can program with this computer, you can program games, you can play games, you can even program robots. So we have a, a, um, a Lego interface for this computer with which you can program a very uh, basic uh, Lego robots and so on. Okay, so um, in conclusion, so why, why do I use games in school? Um, I, I came across this quote, which um, I, I think um, uh, is, is, is a good, oh no, no, I pressed one button too much, sorry. Okay, um, this is by Douglas Rushkoff. So he wrote a book called program or be programmed, right? <laughs> and this is, um, even by reading the title, you get an idea what the book is about, right? So you, you have to learn technology uh, or you, uh, um, or the, yeah, let me read the quote. So instead of learning about our technology, we opt for a world in which our technology learns about us, right? And so this uh, also talks about artificial intelligence and so on, and there's a lot of technology being used. And so I think we have to bring kids to a point where they can understand how the technology works. And games are a great way, way to do so because every, every kid loves computer games and uh, by games they can learn how technology works and um, um, get more active instead of just passively playing games. They can be active and program their own games, program controllers and... Um, yeah, um, uh, and all this is uh, achieved by uh, video games. Okay, so that's it with my uh, presentation. Thank you for listening, and I will uh, hand over the mic to Felix. Thank you. Let's see. And um, so great to hear you talk about uh, all these games and uh, how you've uh, gotten into like engaging your students in the games. And I really love uh, the way you're looking into how the games are made and just not playing them, but also uh, going into the background of the games. But who am I? I am Felix Jullenstig Serao. Uh, and, uh, they say I'm a game-based learning expert. We are humble Swedes, so I don't know about that, but uh, we'll see after this presentation. Um, but what I do at my, uh, at my job is that I'm a developer of uh, education. So we try to see how we can take digital tools and uh, make them for kids so they can learn more about um, everything we do in school and how can digital tools be used uh, in a different way than we do today because using an iPad and writing on it is just like writing on a paper so we need to think outside the box. So I've been a teacher for 11 years and uh, I'm also the author of the book Minecraft as a, pedi uh, as a tool for, pedi uh, for education. I'm so used to saying it in Swedish so <laughs> and it's sadly not, no it's in Swedish uh, as a uh, Minecraft and uh, Pedagogisk Verktyg so a pedagogical tool. 
uh, and I blog as uh, the game teacher, uh, which is also my arena to reach out for the teachers out there who, because I think it's like in Germany that um, there are teachers using games in education, but they maybe don't talk about it as much because they feel like it's outside maybe the comfort zone of the uh, school system. So I try to find, uh, give them a way to feel like somebody else is doing it too. So what can teachers learn from video games? Well, what we need to learn about first is that there's a winning concept of computer games that they use when they design them. And there's a lot of aspects going into this, but uh, I've shortened it a little uh, to uh, make it more comprehensible. So there needs to be clear goals. What are we doing? Mario is saving the princess. Uh, Tetris, we are trying to make the blocks disappear. We know what we are there to do and why, uh, why we're doing it. And to achieve these goals, we have clear rules and obstacles. So we know what we can do and what we can't do. Mario can just run to the right, not to the left, if we talk old school Mario. Um, and in Tetris, we can't move the blocks outside the area that we're playing in, because we know we have to stay inside of that area. And there's an increasing uh, degree of difficulty. Just as Tobias was talking about, we are talking about that flow state, the, the sense that everything is not too hard and not too simple. If it's too simple, uh, you will get uh, bored because it feels like I've already perfected this. But if it's too hard, maybe I will feel like I can't uh, achieve it. So I feel bad and I just want to put the game away. So we have to find that place where where am I? Where is the difficulty for me? And to know that you're making progress, you get a reward. It can be an armor, it can be you come to the next level, it can be points, it can be a star system, you get three stars out of five. Uh, so you get a reward. And even if you lose your game, you get a high score and you know that, you're, well, you've made so many points and you're, and as you were talking about Tobias, the achievement that you made something, even if you died. And there's a voluntary uh, participation, so you can choose if you want to play or not. And that's the same with online games. If you don't want to play online games, uh, you can just turn off the mic or you can turn off the game. So uh, if you don't want to play the game, you can just turn it off. And if you want to play the game, you can turn it on. And there's a narrative that's spanning the game. So you know there's a story there that's, uh, that you're taking place. It's uh, often a hero's journey where you're playing the only one who can save humanity and you have uh, all the tools to make it. So there's the bigger narrative too. And all these make for a great game. And when I look at this as a teacher, I feel like, well, that's just great teaching. Um, and maybe the reward can be that you've, you actually pass the test or something like that. But if we can design it just like the video games and find the students where they are, so they feel that flow state when they're learning, we can make a lot of progress. And when I use games in uh, education, I feel it's very important to know what I'm doing because it's not that I can just put in a game and say play and everything will be fine and they will learn something. No, I have to be very, uh, very designful or know what I'm doing. So what, I've, what we first need is the game, of course. And with the game comes tec uh, technological, technological knowledge. And this is actually based on uh, Mishra and Kohler's TPAC model, but I've twisted it a little bit to make it more uh, into the gaming sense. So we've got the game and we've got to have the content. What are we to learn? What curricular goals are we aiming at? And what, are we, uh, what do we want the students to learn when they play the game? And then we need a how the pedagogical way because even if the game has uh, their way of how to play the game i need to know how to get the students to learn what they played maybe it's uh, three great questions that will make them analyze what did i just do so they know what they've done in the game 
or it's just I've designed it in a way so they have the question or they have something to think about while they're playing. So they're, they're not, not just playing, they're also thinking while they're playing. And when I use those three combined, I feel like there's a flow state in the classroom where they actually are learning while they are playing. So I, I thought I would make some examples what games can do. Uh, so can a game create an idea of what it's, it is like to live in a dictatorship? We have Papers, Please, where you play as a passport controller. Um, I thought about that game a lot today while I was flying, uh, but it's about uh, two countries with a border where you play as the passport controller and you have to make ethical questions or ethical decisions about who you let through or not. And you also have to make decisions based on if they are uh, leg legitimately uh, available to go through. So you will have to check their papers, see if they are the right person and see if they have the papers so they can go over the border. And this, uh, this game makes a lot of ethical questions because maybe you let the wife through because she had the papers and then comes the husband and says, it was my wife you let through, but I don't have the papers. So what do you do? So you get that moral question. Do I let the husband go with her wife or should I just go by the books? Yeah, but she, she, he doesn't have the, real, the papers he needs. Uh, so, uh, a lot of dilemmas. And then we have Republic Times, where you play a newspaper editor, and you choose what, paper, uh, what articles you put in the paper. And the problem is that you, your family, as in a dictatorship, they're a hostage. Because if you don't do your job, your family will suffer. But if you don't put the, uh, the articles, the country will suffer because the articles will have, uh, you will have to balance it with the people's uh, feeling that they want to democratize the country too. So you have to choose the articles that will uh, feed the dictatorship that they feel that you're doing a great job, but you will also have to try to help the people in the country. So it's a, also a dilemma of how it, uh, how it is to live in a dictatorship. Because th that's what I always get the question, why do people go along in a dictatorship? Why don't they just rise up? Well, these are great ways to show that. And we have The Walking Dead, uh, based on the comic book. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a game where you also get a lot of uh, questions about what, what uh, choices would you make in a dilemma, like, uh, who lives or who dies? Really hard questions. And of course, this is a game not made for young kids. Uh, so that's a dilemma for the teachers. But it's a great way to uh, get, a, uh, get a starting question about how to think in different situations. How, how do we think as people? Uh, and these are really uh, hard <laughs> uh, questions to master, but it's a great discussion in the classroom with the uh, right appropriate age. <laughs> um, and we also have civilization where you build your civilization and uh, you can choose uh, if you want to be a Roman or an Egyptian and you follow them through the ages and build a civilization and then try to get to the space age where you colonize a new planet. Or we have City Skylines, the Swedish game where you build cities like SimCity uh, and you try to think about how can we please the people and give them somewhere to live and somewhere to work without getting the industry too close to the, um, too close to the suburban areas where they live or without getting the taxes too high but you still got to, need, you still got to have an income. So you get those uh, different questions that you have to balance as a city planner. But the question is here, if you play those games, will you have learned all those things that we talked about here? Probably not, because you haven't had that question. The thing I was talking about before, how or what are we learning? Because the teacher is a very important key when you're using games in the classroom. It's not that the teacher can go away and take a sip of coffee while they're playing and then come back and everything is fine and they will all get an A. Uh, it's more like you have to be the guide to show them what you played and what you learned here 
is this or ask the question that they will understand that, oh i've learned that and i didn't think about that when i played the game so you have to show the connections between what you played and what you learned because that is not always the case when you've played it you just thought that you oh i made a really nice city but how did you make the city what choices did you make along the way so are we there yet can we just start playing games in the classroom. Just like she said, just put an Xbox in the classroom and we're all fine, or 30 of them. No, of course, we have a lot of obstacles. We talked about that before, me and Tobias, about the ICT skills and how, uh, how the teachers need to have that in their backbone when they're using games. Because it's not easy to just put on a game and feel that everything is going to work out because it's, uh, is very far from the teacher's comfort zone. So we have to help the teachers and give them tools to um, make it possible for them to use games in classrooms. And sometimes if we're going to uh, buy technology, we were already talking about uh, the Raspberry tool that it was very cheap and then every teacher was screaming yay because we don't have a lot of money. Um, so we have to find new ways and seeing Google Stadia and NVIDIA streaming services, maybe that's the future where we can just as well as we're streaming video, uh, movies in the classroom, we can stream video games that the, that the students are playing on their Chromebooks or uh, their uh, digital tools. So there are hardware and um, technological, technology limitations and also this, uh, the teachers are in a, in a way limitations because they need to feel safe and in their comfort zone, zone when they're using uh, the games. So, and something else is that popular games that we were talking about, uh, the serious games that we were talking about before, aren't always made for education. You can play Civilization without knowing anything about the Civilization you played. You can play like an Egyptian, but you don't know much. Okay, the pyramids, I've heard about them, but not much more. So. We need to maybe have education edition of serious games that are more um, prone to talk about what you learned and more um, where they put the goals in what you learn instead of uh, to make your civilization great. And that's a problem with the educational games because we're talking about the serious game and the educational games are sometimes too boring because they are so focused on what to learn that they've forgotten to design in, in a fun way that you would have fun in the classroom. So there's a, a balance here that we have to find. And I think we can find that balance if game developers and teachers would talk together, talk and do like hackathons and try to make greater games where we have the design from the game designers and we have the know-how and the what and the content from the teachers. And if we put that together, we can find something great. Or even put education editions in the games, like for example, Assassin's Creed, which is uh, the latest one, Assassin's Creed Valhalla is actually based in Sweden or in Norway, where you play as a Viking and where you plunder uh, Great Britain for um, land and resources. But what they did is they put an education edition where you actually can play as different parts and different roles and they're having the game designer uh, idea with the goals, what are you doing there, you have the story, you have uh, um, the, like, the game designer aspect which makes it a great way for, teach or for students to learn. But it's hard because in Sweden we, sp we speak a lot of Swedish and it's uh, just in English. And we talk about the Viking Age in the early ages, which are not so, uh, uh, which Assassin's Creed is not made for, for the uh, early ages. So what I'm trying to say is that the game mechanics must be connected to the educational content for, uh, for the students to learn. Uh, just as we said before, Space Quest uh, taught some English. Uh, but it's, it was because it was based on the design. You had to know English to proceed or to progress. Uh, and that is why I think a lot of kids today learn English so fast while playing video games, because they need to know the language to progress. So how can we create these obstacles that are fun to play, but we need to learn to progress? And 
uh, something else than English. And I will show you some quick examples of what I've done, um, both gamification and uh, serious games. So this is one of my first uh, things I did as a teacher when I used games or gamification, as I call it. Um, there was a student who uh, had, had trouble in school and he couldn't concentrate uh, during the lessons. So I asked him, what do you like to do? And he was nine years old and he said, I like to play games. So, okay, you like to play games. What games do you like to play? Well, I like to play Kingdom Hearts and Sonic. Okay. So what can I do with that? I was uh, thinking so. Uh, the class had uh, um, a week schedule. So it's Monday, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And I said, what would happen if I made it level one to level five instead? And put exactly the same thing that the class is doing, like do this math page, write this with this story. Um, but in a context where the game is uh, in. And when he got this, he, he was so glad because he, he knew that I had listened to him and I put the, the games he loved in uh, something that he could use and he could uh, check it off. So when he, was, uh, when he had finished level one, he can get a gratification by uh, turning a color on the ruby there. So, um, and then I gave it to the next teacher who had him and she could use this too. And it, it motivated him to do a lot more in school. Uh, than before, because he felt like it was a game, but it actually was just school. Um, another way is that I've designed games myself um, by making like a game map and where they get characters. And this, uh, uh, this tool is called Classcraft that you can use. Um, it's a Canadian company who's made it. And uh, every student makes their own class and their own uh, character that can get uh, points to get up a level and to evolve. So they have a meaning to why they're there and why they're doing schoolwork. So every quest they do, their character develops, but they also learn something while they're playing. And I've also used Minecraft, of course. Um, and what I like about Minecraft is that it's like a canvas where you can paint and the teachers uh, or the students are the painters, but I am making the rules of what we are painting. Um, because the, in Minecraft is so creative and you can build everything you want, but as a teacher, you have to be like, we are building this and uh, these are the obstacles and the rules that we are uh, following. So what we did is we did a role-playing light that I, um, I took groups in the class and made them farmers and I made them noblemen, like the rich people, and I made them the people who lives in the city, and priests. And all the groups had to build their part of the city. And it's a, a 17th century city. So they built the wall around the city, and they built the church, the priest, and the noblemen or the rich built the uh, castle, and the farmers uh, built uh, the farms outside the uh, outside the wall. And what happened was uh, that they built in the knowledge because we had theories every week. So they had to, they had to read about their uh, education and what they, the content. And what they did was that they uh, had to learn about what, what's in the church because they didn't have a Christian background. So, what, so they had to have a religious uh, study because they had to know what was in the church. But the, the fun thing was that they built in stuff like in the castle, they built a ballroom on the first floor. And I asked, what, why do you build a ballroom on the first floor? Because that is where we party with the taxpayers from the farmers. <laughs> and the farmers were like, hey, what are you doing? So there was a lot of fun and banter in the classroom. But what, what I thought was the uh, most exciting thing was that when we read about the uh, uh, French Revolution two years later, they said that they understood the people because they had lived through that inequality when they were farmers and the rich. So they understood why the French made the revolution. And sustainable cities, um, we built them too, where they can build a sustainable and through theories that are important and that we are thinking that we will use in the future. And as you see, the, the cities aren't 
finished uh, even though they stopped building there because the point isn't to, fi uh, to finish the city and the buildings the, the point is to learn and when we've learned about uh, sustainable cities and what what hurdles we are standing uh, in front of then we are uh, uh, then we reached our goal because in Minecraft you can build forever so why games and gamification in classroom? Well, it creates, it creates motivation and uh, it's a structure for learning and it shows progress so they feel like they're always uh, making progress because uh, the teacher can't always be there and say, great job, the game is doing that too. And um, seeing they're playing a game that they love, they also try to learn about new stuff that they didn't want to learn about before because now they're learning it in a, uh, in a forum that they love. So, and last but not least, it uh, strengthens the students' self-esteem, so they feel like uh, they can uh, they can actually achieve in school and uh, come to school with a happy face instead of a sad face. Um, and these skills are also implemented because they're using the digital tools, they're uh, creating in the digital tools, and they're communicating in the digital tools. So. We're also working with the 21st century skills, which is really hard in school today. We have a big challenge for our students to meet the job market of tomorrow. So last but not least, I want to uh, just say that Jordan Shapiro wrote in his book that the way children play today prepares them for the future. So. When I was little, we played like uh, mom and dad, you know, and we had a dog. And it prepared me for the future when I was getting a family. Um, and today, if we make... Uh, the students are playing too. So I thought we would end with a little time travel. This is actually a cool animation, but they said they couldn't make it work. So um, sadly, it, was just, it will just be a picture. But you will have to imagine cool effects here. <laughs> um, this is pretty fun because I was talking about this before the pandemic and then people were like, are we really going there? But now after the pandemic, they're like, yeah, we are there. Uh, but you will understand when I'm finished. <laughs> well, if we have a meeting room, like, like old school meeting room, we would always sit down and talk to each other. But tomorrow, I think we are going to design the cars and we are going to design our cities and what we're planning uh, in different parts of the world, but in a digital room. So we can be somebody from South America, somebody from Europe, somebody from Africa and somebody from Asia in the same room, but in the digital space. Um, and you will maybe use your headset or AR, augmented reality, to plan this together in a room in this digital conference. And actually, that is where the students are today. And that is what they're learning today, to uh, understand the 3D environment and actually uh, convey their ideas in a 3D tool space. So I think we should meet them there and join them. Thank you. Thank you so thank you so much, uh, Felix and Tobias, for this very interesting input so far. So um, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, that we can be here for this very interesting, I think, uh, topic: German Swedish dialogue on computer games in schools. Yeah, my name is Linda Breitler. As the ambassador said before, I'm a professor for game design. I'm also game designer. Uh, I have a studio in Trier. We develop. Um, Serious games also, um, in referring smart city simulation games. So I found that very interesting in this uh, part. Um, and my first question goes to you, Felix, because um, which is very interesting is what you uh, what you said about good learning. Um, you explained why computer games are so well suited for sustainable and intrinsic learning. Um, like goals, rules, reward systems, feedback systems, and so on, narrative. All this is very, very convincing, I think. Um, but um, what do you say to people uh, who are, uh, based on the examples you choose, uh, you showed us, such as Walking Dead, 
and you said it's not for kids. It's okay, but it was the the edition for I think 12 years old, uh, something like this. Um, when when people are afraid that the negative ethics uh, will transmit it, uh, not the positive ones, um, who are afraid that the wrong things, the wrong things are being learned and taught, what do you tell these people? Well, I think. Uh, games are just like any media uh, that we always have to have a guide when we're watching a movie that maybe is a, a little bit scary or you need your parents there and you need them to understand uh, and to guide you. Uh, but we as teachers also have to know what games to use. So, not, uh, so as I was really clear about not using games that are not made for the age. but. We should not be afraid of using games where you are engaged because sometimes you really need a really hard dilemma to learn something because I remember when I went to school I always knew I, there was always the hard questions that I took with me uh, for a later date and I think uh, that we need to have that struggle uh, and create that struggle to create a uh, longer learning. Yeah absolutely it's also about the, the fact and fiction, you, you can very good understand what that this is fiction and this is not real life. But you talked about age uh, rating and this is very a good topic. It's very hard, it's challenging. Um, we are talking about youth protection. Here in Germany we say USK, this is the agent, agency, uh, Unterhaltungssoftware Selbstkontrolle. This is the huge, uh, the rate, age, age, age rating agency uh, and you have some similar in, in Sweden too I know um, and this is a little bit challenging uh, because not all entertainment game can be used in school uh, this is a question also for you because we're talking about this system in, in Germany um, and we have uh, many issue, issues with that but you you had the example Assassin's Creed I remember Assassin's Creed origin came with a sightseeing mode you you told um, about the, the education edition. Um, Ubisoft made this um, because it was, I think, an 80 uh, rated title. Um, and the, the sightseeing mode is completely without uh, violence. And um, the problem is not many studios can do this. Or you destroy even the game if you no, have no violence in it. So what, what could we do with, it, with this problem? How can we bring? these games in schools, for for example, French Revolution or something like this. I don't know in what class this will be um, uh, educated. Uh, but you cannot play the game because it's rated 18. What, what is your idea? What can we do? Should we support um, the studios to make this education? It was one thing you wanted to, to, ha to have. Yeah, I think um, it's the... Um that's the that's the thing I went uh, with the education edition and I think that we are in a struggle because many video games like Quake and everything is like you progress with by killing mm -hmm. and that is an obstacle that is really uh, easy to make as a game designer and it's very powerful uh, and many games use that as a mechanic to uh, show that you're progressing. And that is a big uh, problem for educational systems because we can't use that. So we have to uh, communicate with game designers uh, to make them understand that we need to have different systems, like maybe a puzzle or maybe a murder mystery where there is only one murder where you find the body, but it's like intertwined with, uh, because I mean, uh, um, we say we have criminal uh, like uh, books where you read about the murder and you try to understand what happened and we can use different I've, I've been thinking about just like the Egyptian uh, theme that uh, maybe you could find the body in the Nile which is you know with the ebb and flow and goes up and down and it's intertwined with uh, with uh, oh, which makes the crops grow and like make the game mechanics and the mystery a part of what you should learn. So you understand, okay, the Egyptians used this to make the crops grow, but there's a murder mystery. And the teacher as the guide can tell what you learned here 
is actually something that is connected to what happened. But um, entertainment games like, for example, Assassin's, Assassin's Creed, they have big budgets. They can make huge worlds, yeah. big worlds, uh, absolutely fascinating, photorealistic and so on. And okay, this time they took the violence out of it and you have a sightseeing mode, but no gameplay anymore. So it's just interesting. It's a huge world um, and it's a second chance to, to use the game in school, but it's not the game than it was before, to be true. Mm. Isn't it like this? Yeah, it's, it's like a like a museum, like a digital museum. So um, uh, exactly. So so especially this um, Assassin's Creed, they uh, they put a lot of effort in designing the game world, and then you can. Um, so when when you use it in school, you can just just walk and um, it's like in, in a digital museum, right? Um, so, but I think it's very interesting to get uh, in contact with game designers. So, so like what you said with the hackathon, hmm. so where you um, design a game by scratch and you just uh, talk about what what you can do and how you can use the game in, in, in school. So that's a very interesting idea. Uh, do you have something like, uh, have you attended something like that or is it just an idea or have you already? No, we have uh, seen the game, the game industry is so big in Sweden. There are incitements, but more indie projects, mm -hmm. more smaller studios, and like independent uh, programmers meet up with the teachers and they make a game over two days. But the tools are so powerful today, and the programming is so powerful that you can actually make pretty great games just by uh, making them over two days. Mm -hmm. So, and it's always a good seed for something bigger to come. So, I think that's uh, probably a great step. So we know the situation in, in Germany, in schools, when we talk about it later, but before I, I must ask you, uh, I want to know how's the situation in Sweden and Swedish schools. I, I read that the Victor Rydberg School in Scot uh, Stockholm declared Minecraft um, as a school subject still in 2013. Um, obligatory, I think. I'm not sure, but... Okay. Um, so... Um, because they, they said they said it's creative it's you, you can learn a lot of things this is what you said what you said to uh, to minecraft so uh, sweden is for us here in germany often a good example for us in dealing with games in school mm. um, when i heard what you say i'm not as sure <laughs> I'm not so sure um, than before. Uh, Minecraft is used by teachers here also. You're a very good example for this. Um, but it's not mandatory and um, it's not provided in the school curricula. That's yeah. a problem. Yeah. And it's not mandatory in Sweden either. We, we haven't really? got any. The only thing we have in the curriculum is programming. Uh, oh. But Minecraft is, uh, you can use it if you have uh, Office. 365, uh, you have the, yeah. uh, the yeah. Minecraft Education Edition, probably the same here, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. yeah, so, but, um, but there, there's no demand, we have nothing in the curriculum about Minecraft, so it's up to every teacher what tools they want to use to learn, or to make the students learn about uh, what, what's in the curriculum. Mm. Yeah, we have a very similar situation in, in Germany, so we have this so pretty much like the, the 21st century skills. So we have these, um, these skills and they say you have to teach them in the mm. school, but it's up to the teacher or to the school how. And so this is a, um, um, so when you want to use games in school, so this is a big um, achievement that you have the opportunity to choose the method you would like to mm. use. And now it's um, it's easier for teacher teachers if they want to use games to to actually use them because of that because um, we are not so before that um, the state told the schools what the content has to be so the content has to be you have to read this book or you have to read this poem now it's you have to teach kids how to. Um, um, how, how a correct, uh, character develops or something. And then you can say, oh, I can, I can use a book or I can use a video game. Yeah, so to achieve the same goal. So this is a big advancement. And um, yes, um, but um, so here in Germany, only very few teachers um, are going yeah. these ways. Yeah, there are some. 
mm -hmm. but, uh, but not so much. Uh, we often say in Germany uh, that one should talk about games in school, uh, but, but in the context of the so-called media competence. And that doesn't mean the media competence of the teachers, but only the media competence of the um, of the children. Um, and of course, they want to talk about dangers, uh, like disorder or something like this. However, uh, you do not find so often teachers like you, uh, you both, um, who see the potential for learning application in computer uh, games. How can we face this fear, what uh, a lot of teachers maybe have, or is it just because they're not gamers or not competent, or what's, what do you think is a problem? So, uh, so when I um, speak to teachers who are afraid of that, so I, um, I sometimes use examples like, so, so I grew up in the 80s with the satanic panic, you know, for playing Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, that all kids are uh, um, learning how to, to kill by playing this game and so on. And you can even go um, further backwards, so when the, the television was invented, so there was a huge fear that now um, uh, this, uh, um, the, the kids are getting uh, corrupted uh, by, by watching too much television. Or even before that, when the book was invented, so now there were no more public reading, so everybody's sitting at home with their book and so on. And I think um, so this helps so that when, when, you, when you look back in times that every time a new media comes up, there is this fear about it. And, and there are, um, so I, I think there are some fears which are real. So for example, now when you play games, they, they have no ending. Right, so when, when we play games as a kid, so we, we played Mario and then it was done and it was over. Now um, there is uh, no ending, there is this free to play concept. World of Warcraft 2004. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, so it, it, it's been a while, yeah. It's been a while, it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> but there are some, uh, some negative points like uh, these um, loot boxing or something where you say, okay, maybe that's not so good for children, right? Mm -hmm. So because it's, it's like a uh, like in Las Vegas, um, yeah, with mm. this um, mechanism. Gambling. Loot box yeah. gambling, yeah. something like this. Yeah, uh, and so um, there are some things which can be addressed and which are not good, but um, it takes some time to, to get to a point where you, where you have a, a real overview of what, what are the advantages, what are the, um, the negative sides, I think. Yeah, and uh, we at uh, the Gothenburg re region where I work, we're trying to see how can we make the way to use games in the classroom so easy as possible, like looking at streaming services so you don't have the technology uh, problems, but also making great guidance uh, documents so they can see what are we going to play, what is happening in the game, because uh, teachers don't play themselves, so they all, always see the screen and what's happening over there. Uh, so we give them, like, uh, try to create a comfort zone for them so they can uh, feel at ease. And that's a good part about education games because they always come with that uh, part. But when it comes to serious games, we, you will have to create it to make it more comfortable for the teacher so they know what the goals are and what we are going to talk, what questions I'm uh, about to ask the students. So we get a good uh, like a learning uh, environment. Yeah. yeah, you both explained or showed some, some examples of, of games that you can use in schools, maybe also serious games. Um, I think this is quite challenging for teachers if they want to do this. Um, if they never played a video game, I don't think they will ever use them unless it's, that's a problem. Um, last year I, I was talking to, to a teacher and uh, it was um, in the lockdown, uh, uh, Corona lockdown, the first one, um, and she asked, she was, she was desperate and she asked her students to install the Min a Minecraft server um, and she said, she, I don't know how to do this. I'm, absolutely noob, I don't know how to do this, but just do it. Um, she was a little nervous because she feared that the, her authority uh, would suffer as the result uh, that, that she don't know how to, how to do it. Uh, but that did absolutely not happen. She, was a, she became a hero for the kids afterwards. Um, they were so happy and they said, our, our teacher is the, is the best teacher in the world. <laughs> and it worked perfectly. 
um, they, they could uh, teach together, they could communicate with each other, and so, so what you can give um, other, can you give other good advice how to start for teachers who want to try it? Or maybe with what kind of games and in what context is? Um, I usually say you don't have to master the technology, you have to master the pedagogy. Uh, because mm. um, as she tried, she saw that the, the students were actually the ones who were tech savvy. They know how to uh, fix things. And that's how I use Minecraft in my classroom too, because I'm not the expert of Minecraft. So when it starts to rain, I say, how do you stop the rain? And three, uh, three PL students <laughs> raise their hands and say, we fix it, and they fix it. <laughs> Uh, and the, the heartwarming thing about this is that it's the students that don't achieve in school otherwise. It's, they are the ones that get to raise their hand and know what to do. And they build the coolest stuff because they know how to build it because they do it at home. So they get to achieve in school and show what they know. And they want to learn because they know they can uh, achieve something in the game. And they know how to build it. Do you think it's more a financial problem or it's a political fi uh, question to to, um, uh, to to make better um, advice to technology skills and so on of the teachers? Where, where do you think we, we should start in the universities uh, to to teach teachers or where do where should where should we start? What's your opinion? So uh, I think people often think it's a big financial problem because, um, you know, as again, as in the video, so putting game consoles, so where, where do we get the money for a game console or for, for a game? But there are very um, low level things I think you can do. So for example, um, um, there is um, um, there are some um, uh, games, so they're called not games. <laughs> like a browser game where you so for example there is an uh, there's a game where you play an, an, an old lady on the uh, at the graveyard and she's just walking to a grave and then back but and it, it looks like a 3d action game but you can walk only very 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 slowly and then you can just sit down at the bench and there's nothing you can do and so there are these games who play with the concept of a game or um, where you have um, so uh, moral decisions which you have to make. Uh, so um, there are very um, so the, the, this is a good entry, I think, for for teachers who don't know anything about games. So they can just put the computer uh, uh, connected to the uh, projector and then just make somebody play this game, and then you can discuss what, what happens in the game, what is a video game, are there different kinds of video games, like different kinds of books. Um, for example, what, what I do at um, my German lessons is uh, the, the kids bring a book, their favorite book, and then we uh, talk about what would, um, when, you, when you turn the, uh, when you Great. read the first page, what do you think, could you make a video game out of this book and how would it look like? And then we try to program it with Scratch. And by this they, they learn um, different um, ways to how to analyze literature, how the, uh, where is the story best told, is it in a book or in a video game or in a movie? And then you can compare different kinds of media. And this is something teachers always did. And uh, so this is something they um, which is very easy to do. And as you said, so um, the pupils know, know a lot and they, they are very happy to share their knowledge. It, video games are art, they are, they are literacy, media literacy. You, can, you have a lot of historic scenarios in it and whatsoever. You can, of course, do, do what you want. <laughs> uh, I have an example for you in Berlin and we have a game studio here, um, Paint Bucket Games. They made a, a very often awarded game um, with a background, with a historical background, it's an anti-fascistic computer game uh, through the darkest of times. Um, uh, and um, 
this is re recommended to, to use in schools. Uh, it's not a serious game, but it feels a little bit like, it feels maybe like a documentary game. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know this. Mm -hmm. um, you play in, in, in this time, but uh, against uh, fascism, and uh, you have a lot to, to discuss um, in yeah, historic backgrounds. So if you know this game, uh, what do you think? It's, it, is this a future of, of game development for educational games? that you have kind of serious, kind of documentary uh, approach, but it's of course, it's an engaging game, it's not boring or something like mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good example because it, it works as a game. So um, it can be used in school, but the success came outside of the school. This is a very good sentence. It, it works as a game. Yeah. So it can be used uh, in school. And that is so. I think that is always a good sign. <laughs> so when you yeah. when you actually have a have a, a fun and engaging uh, game. So yeah, I, I think that's that's great. But I think we we shouldn't wait so that every game is like Assassin's Creed with an education uh, part. So this is great when you have this. This is a, this is a perfect thing. But I think it's also uh, very interesting to to just uh, talk about games or how games work and to um, uh, a bit uh, uncover the mystery of how a game works or why is a game so engaging to you. And so... Because of its interactivity, yeah. maybe, and the feedback system. So this is the, the, the common sense is learning by doing or mm -hmm. learning by failing. Yeah. What, what you do in the, in the game, you, yeah. you fail, but you have no problem to fail because there's no one who, say, uh, who says to you, uh, no, um, you lose. Uh, yeah. No? Um, and this is, I think, the great potential from, from game, for, for games in, in classrooms and in other um, lessons. Uh, in, in studies in, in universities and so on. Yeah, yeah what exactly. And what, what you said about gamification. So it's very interesting because um, uh, the whole digital world is designed like a game. So when you say, so why are you collecting points when you buy stuff, right? When you, <laughs> why do you, uh, how does it work? Or oh, when, when you have this notification in your app, and you say, oh, well, it's designed that you just click it and it's, it's, it's a game mechanic. And um, so I think this is um, yeah, very interesting to, to look at games, how they work, and then to look at our digital world, at social networks, how do they work. And they have a lot of gamification elements because this is a very powerful thing, which you, which you know when you, <laughs> you, just, you just have to uh, um, d d design the worksheet with a video game character and suddenly <laughs> there's a kid and say, wow, this is the greatest thing ever only because there is a, a, a another picture on it and um, this is interesting to discuss so why is it like that or this this element of uncertainty which games have that there are different boxes and you can open up the box and see is something inside no and, and how does it have to be designed that you open up every box and this is a very powerful mechanic um, and um, which can also be used in a bad way but um, I think it's um, it's interesting to uncover this mechanic. And then you can also talk about how the brain works. Why is it so interesting for the brain to do this thing over and over and over again? Yeah, what you're talking about is digital literacy. Yeah. And that is definitely something that we should learn. That is why I was so keen to your idea about checking the background, programming mm -hmm. the games, mm -hmm. just to see how it works and what, 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 what triggers me. Uh, mm -hmm. And that makes you understand what's positive and what's negative yeah. because i think we're, we're soon, that is the next step for society to understand how uh, we are uh, like being susceptible to uh, these gamification forces mm -hmm. in a good way and a bad way yeah, yeah. And, and this is what uh, you also had, uh, mentioned uh, the flow theory um, you said it's uh, game mechanics then <laughs> uh, but yeah. it's the same like the flow theory of yeah. uh, Mihal Kriksantihal which became famous um, basically it's about the fact that computer games can definitely create this flow if the game mechanics um, and the story are immersive and suitable not every game is capable to, to create flow channel of course but the good ones do and what we can learn from, from 
um, in, in the teaching context is the flow um, is responsible for sustainable learning and sustainability is a very important thing. Sustainability and you get uh, the intrinsic motivation, you have the, uh, the uh, Problem. Uh, you don't have the problem with a with boring uh, f factor and so on. So um, how can we um, we use or really use this um, this potential um, that the right things can be learned? I say right things because they are not yeah bad good things something like this. What what are the right things to learn and how can we make the right game mechanics to to do this? I think that's the million dollar question, right? <laughs> I mean, if we, okay. would, if we would have that answer here, we would probably use it in schools. Mm. And I, I think we are still designing uh, the classroom. And we've touched on various points here, which is uh, making things complicated. And it's like the, the student's role uh, and the teacher's role are very different today. And the students um, I live in a very different world than the 80s, <laughs> which makes it uh, they have other uh, perceptions of how to learn because they have the internet. In the 80s, we didn't have the internet. And that's, uh, so the teachers don't have a monopoly uh, of teaching. Uh, so we have to find new ways because um, we have to motivate the kids because they need motivation today to learn uh, because they don't see it in the same way. And then we need to find that flow state. And how we find it is, I think it's up to design. It's different for every subject, different for every teacher. Because we also know that we are different teachers. Uh, we are probably different persons and, and no teachers are the same. We have one important thing here. You, you talked about the level of difficulty, which is, I think, a very good uh, idea to, to think about it. Because you can individualize learning content. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in, in games, you can use this dynamic um, game metrics to um, to have a, a level of difficulty which is just individualized. But uh, in games, we ha you have to be very, very careful to use it because it feels like you you get cheated or you you are a cheater. But in the learning context, this is absolutely great. I think so. It gives you the, the possibility. To, for, for everybody to learn or, or to come into this flow channel. Uh, if you have the right game metrics, which is nothing else, then you, you see what people do and how they go on. And is it too hard? Then we make it a little bit easier. Is it too, too, too low? It's boring. You can, so, and this is an advantage against the, the typical 1-2-N uh, classroom situation. Yeah, and if a game can do that, that is digital and can give feedback to the students, that is a very good thing because uh, it's very, it's one of the biggest challenges today for a teacher to stand in front of 30 uh, students who have different, uh, like some find it too boring, some find it too hard, and finding that uh, flow state with 30 individual uh, humans in a classroom is very, very hard. But that's why I think digital tools today, like games, can really help. And with the help of AI and, and like machine learning, they can find where the students are and challenge them on the right level. Um, but I think we're just uh, at the first steps of that. And we haven't seen uh, the power of that. Uh, and many teachers are like, are the computers going to take over? Are they just going to play games that meets them in a flow state? Well, maybe. But I think the teachers still have a very important role in the classroom with the absolutely, relationship yeah, and with the guidance and with the, uh, like, <laughs> seeing if the students are feeling OK and if they're learning or if they're cheating. <laughs> Uh, so I think we are finding a balance there between digital tools and the teacher's roles. And I think maybe I, there yeah, the flow yeah, I think, state can I think be we have the, the, this um, protected uh, space in games. What you have in, in games, you're protected, you, you're not um, frustrated because there's no one who said you're, you're a loser. Yeah. Um, how, how can we... Um, how can we take the protected space uh, from the game in the, into the classroom? How can we transfer this on behalf of these two important effects, trial action and self-efficiency, what we have in games? Mm -hmm. 
are there methods we can use? You, you showed that hard tools? game uh, that, uh, yeah. was with the square. Yeah. But I, I played another game. It's not game. just hard, it's the hardest. Uh, the hardest game, yes, yes. <laughs> and it tells you that over and over. <laughs> uh, well, wasn't it a fluffy fairy or something like that? We're I think it's just called the world's hardest game. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing I saw in another game that I thought was very uh, like ingenious was that uh, usually you have achievements that you're going to do or goals. Mm -hmm. And one game had you have to f die three times to get this achievement. So you had to fail to win. And it was so ingenious and, and why shouldn't we learn uh, the students that it's okay to fail because why yeah. because when we fail we learn it's uh, I mean experience points in games it's experience and in life we get experience too and we should learn that experience even if it's negative is good because we get feedback that well I have to adjust myself I think or, this is a very good message for every teacher isn't mm. it yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the, the try and error principle to take over in the classroom, to, to, to make a protected space like in games, yeah. yeah. Where the stakes aren't too high, or you, you dare to make mistakes and uh, try to get the fail state, even because you know that it won't give you an F or the lowest grade. And because I think that's the terror balance in the classroom too, mm -hmm. that uh, there's always a grade. Uh, yeah. I think we definitely still need to talk about communities. Um, due to, to Corona, maybe due to Corona lockdown, um, I heard, I'm not sure if it's really true, but I heard last year when um, the lockdown forced uh, children to, to stay at home and they couldn't even meet their friends, um, it was said that Fortnite service collapsed. Um, in, in Italy, I'm, I'm sure, but um, I'm, I'm not really sure if it's true, but uh, we had a lot of um, game activity all over the globe. This is, this is absolutely say, uh, true. So um, children and young people have always communicated with her commu their communities in games uh, all over the world, World of Warcraft, um, when, whenever my friend uh, is in, in, in Japan or America, no problem. Uh, we are um, uh, playing together and so they, we have communities all over the world that are not regional. So my uh, friend uh, who lives uh, next door or so, um, and this is, I think, I'm not sure, but um, some parents, some teachers are uh, very criti uh, critical precisely because of this, because they don't understand what this kind of community means. And they see, okay, they're playing more and more and more, and yet with corona, the effect is even stronger. So they are frightened that this will have so, this is dangerous, this is just negative effect because they don't see the community behind. Yeah. What, what's your... What, What's your opinion um, about that? I usually joke about it that the parents are telling their kids to go out and play so they can be social, but when they go out and play, they're alone because everybody is social on, online and playing their Fortnite and everything. <laughs> and, uh, so, but I heard. Out there. <laughs> but I heard the statistics that uh, last year, uh, during one month, uh, the, uh, the player count was three and a half billion hours during one month of Fortnite. Fortnite yeah, so three and a half billion hours that were played during one month of Fortnite. So, these, and I think it's the community and feeling a part of something. And that's, that's the intrinsic value too, that I'm a part of something bigger uh, and we are working towards something, towards next season or towards the winning the game or, so I think, uh, and, uh, the community about uh, where I find my friends is you know, online, is digital. And yeah. I think that's hard to parent, for parents to understand. And uh, even um, a lot of times the community is more important than the game. Mm -hmm. So because the game gets boring, but it's never boring to talk to your friends online or to, to talk about different things. And it's, uh, some games are even like, like, yeah, like making a telephone call with, with your friend. You're, you're playing the game, but it's more important to talk to your friend because you know they are online. Yeah. What, what would you tell parents or teachers? J just play Fortnite with your children? <laughs> I did. 
Yes, so, so my daughter is, is not at the, so it's only three years old, so I have some time to figure that out. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult because, um, so we know there are also some, some very toxic environments in gaming communities where um, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of hate speak, uh, speech and so on and you cannot control it. So there is... Um, it depends on what community It depends have. on the game and Lol, it, it depends uh, on the community. League of yeah. Legends, yeah, this is very toxic, but there mm -hmm. are other communities... Where well, it's great, yeah, better, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so I think we, we all made that experience that there is a great community in a, in a video game. But um, um, yeah, there is always this question about how, um, what can we, uh, can we transfer to school or which, what can we recommend as a teacher, what, what they should do. Um, knowing that there are some things that, that can go wrong in, in, in this unprotected uh, environment, like, like in Fortnite, for example. Yeah, and I think also you don't have to play the game. Just sit beside your uh, child while they're playing and ask questions like you're interested, actually interested in what's happening on the screen and sit there for like, decide that I have to sit here for 50, 15 minutes or 30 minutes and I will ask questions to understand and like really go, go for it. Mm -hmm. Because then you will understand and not by banning, because even if there's toxic environments, they won't tell you because they know that uh, the parents will say no more game for you because you just hear those bad words. So you have to create a, a, like a discourse where you can talk with your child and uh, so they will open up if there's a bad community or something like that. But, mm -hmm. but sit with your child and you don't have to play the game. You can just uh, ask the questions and really try to be interested. Mm -hmm. And maybe you will learn something and uh, you can join. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, questions is a, g a very good um, idea. Um, maybe there are still some questions here in the audience. I wanted to say that we have a, we have a new tool here. <laughs> and I really want to play with this. <laughs> you need to say a question and I will go like this. <laughs> Does anybody have a question? I have a lot of questions. We talked about KI in school. And you, maybe you have a question? Or uh, above, okay. <laughs> Okay. I, I, have, I have a question later on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, all of you, for the great discussion and uh, the great, this great input on the topic. Uh, I actually work at the German Foundation of the Video Game Industry, yeah. and I'm a project lead there where we have a project about bringing games to school, and we are currently at 10 schools here in Berlin bringing games to school, for example, teaching uh, math and statistics with Mario Kart, or using Gone Home in English and stuff like that. And in my opinion, or in my experience, it's not really what uh, you talked about, how to get the teachers to, to use games in schools. Most, or a lot of the young teachers especially, they are very, very interested in getting uh, games and getting the students' engagement via video games. Um, in my experience, it's basically the top level. It's politic or the, the politicians and the, the, the city, the state, and it's also the higher-ups in the school hierarchy who are blocking these developments. And so um, I guess my question for you would be, how do we break this, uh, this, this de defense of these higher-ups? How do we um, convince basically the old guys that video games <laughs> can be um, it's especially interesting and motivational tool for educations because young student, uh, teachers, they want to use it, but it's like the uppers who don't give them the opportunity to do so. One thing is, I think discussions like this are helpful. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not, it's not enough of this too, yeah. Question was for you. I think we should mobilize. Uh, like, like I said in the beginning, we, we are islands, and here you're sitting telling us that 10 schools in Berlin are using games, and we have no, uh, I didn't know. No, or, no, no. Me too. Yeah. Exactly. So we need to mobilize to, um, to show that there is a support for this kind of learning. And also, I always say that the greatest ambassadors are the, uh, are the students. They are the ones who tell the older teachers. Uh, Felix classes are the best 
And they'll be like, and I don't go to them and tell them, you should use Minecraft or you should use this. No, the students uh, are the ones who are marketing. And I think if we can do it on a wider scale and show what benefits there are and how we can use it to, to educate students in a new way, I think we can change minds. You was talking about Quest to Learn. This is a school that was invented in, in New York from Katie Zahlen. Mm -hmm. I think, and um, this is so um, success, su successful, very um, sustainable learning and so on. Um, and this is one of a good example, and mm -hmm. you can take all the other schools as very good examples. F uh, just invite the higher people, <laughs> whatever that means, um, to, to see what happens in the schools. Yeah, and what, what you said with the 21st uh, century skills, so I think this, um, this concept which we have with uh, different uh, competences, um, so um, um, just show how they can be achieved with games. So this is what, um, what I do, I try to um, c connect what I do with video games in school with uh, these um, so in, 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 uh, in Düsseldorf, so in Nordrhein Westfalen, where I'm from, it's called the Median Kompetenzrahmen. <laughs> so, and uh, there is something like this in every state in Germany. And uh, I think this is a great way to show. So this is um, what, the, what the kids should learn. And here is a way how they can learn it with video games. And here in Berlin, Berlin we have the Stiftung Digitale Spielkultur. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. Um, and they uh, started to um, they started to to collect or to to give advice what game you can use and how um, f just for teachers. I know this is um, the, you can find it on the website. I think. Yeah, we have we have an entire list of uh, educational games that can be used um, for for. Uh, yeah, I work at this foundation uh, um, that you talked about. Yeah, we have an entire list uh, of games where we ca you can u see um, which games to use in uh, which different topics and which different, different subjects. And we have an especially interesting list now on online for like uh, two months, which talks about um, history in games and which games can be used for uh, teaching history and remembering, especially history in the German context about the Third Reich and uh, the NS time and stuff like that, yeah. But, but I was thinking about your question just also that um, in Sweden we talk a lot about new public management and it's about uh, seeing statistics. And I think that's a part of it too. For, because you can, you can tell the politicians or whoever, the universities, that gaming is so great, it's so wonderful, so creative, uh, but they want to see statistics. Uh, how can it change grades? How will it make school or like the teaching better? And I think we need to really be uh, thorough uh, or like uh, really checking and seeing the statistics and how I've used the game, how did it change the classroom environment and how did it change the grades to show that it actually will change um, like the, the students' grades. Because uh, the, statistics, the, the statistics are often something that you go to. What, what change did you see? Well, they had more fun. That's not a statistic. Uh, but it's a good statistic if you want to have a good classroom. But I think uh, it's not what you make change or change the minds of politicians or whoever is up there. Thank you. Um, so I was uh, wondering, because prior to the talk, we were talking about teaching AI um, and different approaches to teaching new topics like artificial intelligence or machine learning. And I was wondering, uh, because what we are doing in our university is we, we are developing approaches for teaching such uh, new topics um, in an unplugged way. And here, during the talk, you were talking a lot about the video-based games, so video games. And I was wondering, do you have any experiences with the unplugged games? Are they as good as the video games? And yeah, I just was wondering if you have uh, experiences with that in the schools and how the children react to the unplugged activities. Are they 
um, excited about playing even with an unplugged uh, games or would they just prefer playing video games? So, yeah, maybe one word about that. Thank you for the question. Very interesting question. Just um, one, one word. I make board games with my student in my first in the first year, um, and this is very very um, exciting. This makes it a lot of fun, and you you learn how to um, develop um, develop the replay value, uh, how to develop uh, rule sets, and someone that works very good. And so, so this is a nice idea to do it. You can you don't need any computer. Yeah, and I think okay. yeah, so that games are games, and I think every teacher uses games in school, so, and they they have been used for I think forever. Teachers were using game methods without, maybe without knowing, or um, but uh, um, teachers are very familiar with the concept of playing games, and uh, yeah, I think that um, it um, there is a there is a good connection when you um, say, okay, you you were always playing games, and now um, you can digitalize some of these things. I think this is what you do with the Glasscraft. Uh, um, approach. So there are um, uh, concepts with which you could use offline before, but not in, not so effectively, right? Yeah, exactly. And and I'm thinking also. I was I was at the conference and they were talking about the students playing outside and and the, that teacher said that they just want to play a game called Mafia all the time outside. And I don't know if the same co if it's the same concept, but uh, in in Sweden, mafia is actually just among us the game, but in uh, like uh, real context. Mm -hmm. But she didn't know that Among Us was a very popular game during that peri period. But she just hit it right with mafia, and they were like, mm -hmm. "Yeah, let's play that." So she was just using the same game mechanics, but in uh, like a non-digital way. Mm -hmm. yes. I heard that everybody is playing in the school. That everybody is playing squid games mm. um, in, in real life. You have that in Germany too. Yes, it's so successful. So I think I, this yeah. is, goes in this uh, satanic panic, yeah. panic area. So where yeah. you know everybody is afraid that yeah. uh, you know they are, they are playing it. So so. Uh, but at least are, this is what I thought when I read it. So, so that okay, there's this one school and. Uh, um, so I, I, I but but the thing is you, they use kid games, kids games. So this is the pervert thing in it. Uh, but mm -hmm. just okay. We we wanted to talk about your question. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Or was it enough answer for you? Or yeah. Okay. I think we have a lot more questions, but maybe we should go upstairs, have a drink, and talk to each other, and uh, so you can have your last questions to the, this fantastic panel upstairs, and you can look at the exhibition. Thank you, Tobias Hübner, uh, Linda Brauchleich, and Felix Jönastik Ferrero. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>